Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Museum of the City of New York on this rainy night. Hope you weren't caught in the downpour. Uh, my name is Fran Rosenfeld. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the museum, and I'm delighted to um, see such a great crowd out tonight. Uh, thanks for joining us for tonight's program, Searching for Soul, New York City in the Age of Hypergentrification. And we're super honored to be joined this evening by writers Jeremiah Moss, author of Vanishing New York, Sharifa Rhodes Pitts, author of Harlem is Nowhere, cartoonist Julia Wirtz, and last but not least, our moderator, New, York, New Yorker staff writer Vincent Cunningham. And they're going to sit down after some brief readings that they're each going to do uh, to discuss what it means to capture the soul of the city in today's uh, lightning speed changing urban landscape. And this is, of course, uh, a subject that almost every New Yorker has passionate opinions and anecdotes to share about. As you walked in, uh, you may have noticed there, were, there was a slideshow of images up of various vanishing New York spots around the city, most of which were sent in by you, the audience. So thanks for those submissions. Um, uh, perhaps needless to say, here at the Museum of the City of New York, we're obsessed uh, with the topic of uh, capturing the soul of the city and trying to figure out uh, what that means and what that has meant ever since um, the beginning, the city's origins. And as many of you know, in the last uh, two years, the museum has opened a, a permanent exhibition called New York at its Core, 400 Years of New York History. It's the first time in the museum's history that we've had actually a permanent exhibition about the city of New York. And the great theme that captivated and obsessed the curators of the exhibition was how in three relatively small galleries, I mean, we're not the Smithsonian, how do you capture the history of the city and how do you capture, go to the core of New York and sort of capture the city's DNA and how it's changed over time. And if you haven't had a chance to visit this um, exhibition, I welcome you to and encourage you to come back. We're open every day, 10 to 6. In three galleries, they make the case that there are four strands of DNA, so to speak, that define New York's identity and make it distinct from any other global metropolis. And that those four qualities are ever present in New York's history and per perhaps will be into the future, perhaps. Uh, those qualities or those strands of DNA are density, extreme density, extreme diversity, extreme amounts of money and the pursuit of money, the having and the having not of money, and that putting all those three things together in the Petri dish, you get unparalleled creativity not just in the sense of artistic creativity, but innovation and, and new ways of living in cities. And so that's the thesis of the exhibition. And the question before all of us is, is how permanent in the DNA are these four qualities? Are each of the four density, diversity, money, creativity? We can't take them for granted. And wit, they're ever coming and going. And what's going to happen in the future if the money and the density keep rising but the diversity and the creativity um, do not keep a pace. And so those are, you know, that's just a broad view of some of the, some of the basic questions that we are always thinking about here at the museum. Um, I would like to thank our promotional partners for tonight's event, in particular the Center for the Living City, the Preservation League of New York State, and the Weeksville Heritage Center. Thanks so much. Um, for your support, and you can find a complete list uh, of program sponsors in your program. And I also just want to briefly mention, we hope to um, want to tell you about a fun program that we're doing late, uh, later in July, on July 29th. It's called Secret Central Park, a scavenger hunt. And it's a park-wide scavenger hunt matching where you're being asked to match historical images using an app on your phone to present day locations. And this is really designed, this is not a generic scavenger hunt, this is really designed to appeal to very passionate New York insiders and history buffs. Um, and then we end with a party here on the terrace. So please check that out online. And at this time I'd like to ask you, please turn off the, so the sound of your phones and your watches, but feel free to tweet using the hashtag um, MyNYCSoul. 
And finally, before I introduce our speakers and we begin the conversation, I would love to share with you a four minute documentary short which voices and uh, vividly illustrates some of tonight's themes. It's called June Fish Market, and it was made by New York filmmaker Christopher Ming Ryan, who we're honored to have here with us in the audience tonight. Um, we're gonna play the film, and then I'll come back right after to introduce our panel. Uh, thank you, Christopher, for sharing the film with us, and um, perhaps our speakers will, will reference it during the conversation, although there's many, many things to talk about. I'm now um, gonna briefly introduce our speakers and then invite uh, each of them to come up and share a reading and then take a seat on the stage, um, starting with Jeremiah Moss. He's the author of Vanishing New York, How a Great City Lost Its Soul, it came out in 2017, and is the creator of the award-winning blog, Jeremiah's Vanishing New York. His writing on the city has appeared in the New York Times, New York Daily News, and online at the New Yorker and the Paris Review. Um, Sharifa Rhodes Pitts is the author of Harlem is Nowhere, a journey, to the Mecca of, a journey to the Mecca of Black America, which was a New York Times notable book of 2011 and a National Book Critics Circle finalist. She's currently working on her trilogy on African Americans and Utopia. And so in, in addition to her 2011 book about Harlem, her future works are going to address Haiti and the Black Belt of the American South. Um, we have Julia Wurtz with us, who is a professional cartoonist, amateur historian, and part-time urban explorer. Her latest book is Tenements, Towers, and Trash, an unconventional illustrated history of New York City. And her previous autobiograph autobiographical graphic novels include Drinking at the Movies and The Infinite Weight and Other Stories. And then we are honored to have as our moderator tonight, writer Vincent Cunningham, uh, Vincent joined The New Yorker as a staff writer in 2016. His writing on books, art, and culture has appeared in The New York Times Magazine, The New York Times Book Review, Vulture, and McSweeney's, where he wrote a column called Field Notes from Gentrified Places. So um, now, without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Jeremiah to come up to the stage and do a reading, and then the rest of the panelists will follow. Hello, thank you for coming. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to read a little bit here. I can't see anybody. That's all right. <laughs> <clears throat> there are many New Yorks, as many as there are New Yorkers, each one of the eight million and change carrying a personal metropolis in the heart. My city is the city of artists, writers, and assorted outcasts. It's the city of E.B. White's passionate settlers, the boy arriving from the Corn Belt with a manuscript in his suitcase and a pain in his heart. The city that I'm talking about is the one that throughout history has been a beacon to dissatisfied and desperate people, whether they were escaping from Peoria or Flatbush or Old San Juan. My city is the city of dark moods, scrapyards, and jazz, of poets, painters, and anarchists, of dirty bookstores, dirty movies, and dirty streets, of Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue trumpeting over black and white Manhattan, and Travis Bickle's taxi roving through the steamy rain, that grimy yellow splash. It's the city of Edward Hopper's melancholy rooms and Frank O'Hara's I do this, I do that. It's also a working class city peopled by men and women who love with tough love in thick accents and no time for bullshit. It's a tuna sandwich at Eisenberg's, an egg cream at Ray's Candy, and sometimes lunch at 21. It's shoe shines, dive bars, and riding the subway all the way to Coney Island for a corn dog and the freak show. Your city may differ, but if it's anything like mine, you're grieving, too, because the stuff of it, the gut-level feeling of it, is vanishing fast. Too much is already gone. We all have our own lost city. If we stick around long enough, we lose the city of our youth, our dreams, and foiled ambitions. But this book isn't about how we all lose our personal city. It's about how the city has been taken from us. It's not just the story of a death. It's the story of a murder. 
From its beginnings, but especially since the late 1800s, New York was the unbridled engine of the nation's progressive culture and creativity, sustaining a diversity of people, feeding the world with art, ideas, and ways of life that pushed the boundaries of convention. But now it seems this period has come to an end. The spirit of the city as we knew it has vanished in the shadow of luxury condo towers, rampant greed, and suburbanization. If you take away just one thing from this book, let it be this. Hypergentrification and its free market engine is neither natural nor inevitable. It is man-made, intentional, and therefore it is stoppable. And yet, just as deniers of global warming insist that nothing out of the ordinary is happening to our world's climate, so deniers of hypergentrification say that nothing out of the ordinary is happening to New York, that its extreme transformation is just natural urban change. So let me be clear. I'm not talking about the weather. I'm talking about the climate. And New York's climate has been catastrophically changed. Thank you. I want to acknowledge that we meet this evening on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Brekgawawank people of the Unami group of the Lenape. They lived here at Brekwanawis, which included a settlement a few blocks from where this museum now sits, Kamande Kong, the hill near which they fish with nets. They repudiated the sale, itself substantiated by legend and a forged deed of northern Manahata to Peter Minuit. Um, I'm glad to be here tonight. Thank you for having me. I'm reading not from my book, Harlem is Nowhere, but from an essay I wrote a few years after that book came out, but before I moved to Brooklyn, which um, was never an ambition of mine. <laughs> it was commissioned by Creative Time and um, went along with an exhibition that happened there called Black Radical Brooklyn. And it concerns partly the history of the Weeksville settlement. This is from 2014. Recently in Brooklyn's Flatbush neighborhood, two women aged 30 and 23 knocked on an apartment door to gain entry and then demanded at gunpoint that its current occupants vacate the premises. As reported in the New York Daily News by way of motive, one of the women later declared to police that she was, quote, tired of white people moving into the area, end quote. The New York Post added that one of the women was angry that the apartment had been rented to three white residents instead of to her. The three victims, two men and one woman, fled the apartment upon Baroque threats of death. Quote, if you call the police or management company, I'll pick five people off of your phones and kill them. And if you're not out of here in 24 hours, five guys will come back and kill you all, end quote. The two women, identified in reports as Precious Parker and Sabrina James, remained in the apartment for two days before being apprehended by the police. Headlines detailing the incident declared the women to have, quote, squatted in the apartment after the armed encounter. This pointed description, along with the women's alleged racial motivation, transforms the incident from just another bizarre made-for-tabloid Gotham crime to a flashpoint in the protracted struggle black and poor people endure to settle in this city. The women were arrested for robbery, burglary, unlawful imprisonment, criminal possession of a weapon, and menacing. No mention of hate crime charges has been made so far, except from the army of commenters asking sarcastically why weren't Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, and Eric Holder jumping on the case. Something about the headline gave off a dark humor, as if it belonged to the satirical news so beloved by our age, a crime resulting more from weariness than malice, one that openly declared something many people think and say without resorting to similar acts of violence. See, the rent is too damn high. Furnished only with the bare details of newspaper accounts, I hesitate to make the women's actions say more than the women themselves are alleged to have said. Their act cannot be understood in any clear or credible way as political. The race of the victims and the race of the perpetrators do not automatically make the event coherent. It does not conform to any 
post-civil rights era tales we tell ourselves about how we are going to bring about a just world. But can the actions of these two women be understood as a form of resistance, an inherently futile form of resistance to be sure, for they had literally backed themselves into a corner with no means of escape. Inevitably, they would draw the attention of the state. Perhaps, like many of their peers, they were already under the surveillance of the state, which is to say, perhaps they were already living in a room with no exit. The attempt at theft, apartment jacking, sought as its loot the physical space, the lease, the occupancy. But once they had the space, what were they going to do with it? They could not flee. They could not exchange it for money. They were stuck in a worse version of the same situation. Perhaps what they were stealing was time. I am sending myself into those news reports, into those two days of squatting. I am sitting with Precious Parker and Sabrina James and their gun and their tiredness. No, I'll say it, my tiredness, because I too would not be able to afford to move in the neighborhood where I now live, only I don't have a gun or the will to use it. There is nothing to do in this room but wait, so we tell each other stories. I tell them about Fannie Lou Hamer, famously sick and tired of being sick and tired. Hamer endured beatings and was part of the larger nonviolent movement, but in response to the constant threat of white supremacist terrorism in Mississippi said, I keep a shotgun in any, every corner of my bedroom and the first cracker even looked like he wants to throw some dynamite on my porch, won't write his mama again. I'm telling them about the occupation of a tent city in Lowndes County, Alabama, erected when black sharecroppers were forced off their farms for attempting to, to vote in the same place where the Black Panther Party was founded. Precious Parker and Sabrina James used the threat of violence to procure, however temporarily, space to live, to be. I am working to understand their actions in light of other happenings in the city that we have agreed are legal and nonviolent. It is supposedly nonviolent when real estate developers secure special privileges for including affordable housing in new luxury buildings and then create a second, separate entrance, a poor door, for the underclass of residents to use. It is supposedly nonviolent when landlords and brokers in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, systematically dispossess renters by means of paltry lease buyouts and unjustified evictions. If this act of apartment jacking has any legitimacy, it is borrowed from the very founding of this nation. Here it was a petty crime as form of historical reenactment. Without the benefit of pilgrim period costumes, Parker and James rehearsed the method by which property was violently transferred from the indigenous people of this land to colonial settlers. In my book, Harlem is Nowhere, I summarize the problem of Harlem's future as a black place thusly. This is our land that we don't own. Here is a territory to which black people have a spiritual psychic claim by dint of having suffered there, having loved there, having stewarded generations in the face of destruction there. The attachment to place across generations is a topic I have spoken about publicly, repeatedly, seeking to assert the value of rootedness in a time when its lived reality is eroding. But I did not, in the writing or the speaking, realize that I was doing so while sitting in a room with no exit. The violent transfer of land to European settlers created the fiction of property just as it enshrined the legend of the lifeless, worthless, soulless black body that could be turned into a slave. Truly, our land that is not ours. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for coming, everyone. I, um, I'm just gonna show some slides from my book, which is actually very similar to what you were watching in photographs as we were waiting for the program to begin. Um, so this is a book called Ten Minutes, Towers, and Trash, and in it, I drew a lot of then and now scenes. So up here we have Broadway in 1915, and below the same exact street in 2015. And I had a friend point out recently, um, you know, I was complaining, oh, everything's so different and, you know, shitty now. And, and he was like, actually, it's exactly the same because it was a bunch of Broadway shows they're advertising for and things they were selling. So, you know, you have like a Coca-Cola ad and then all the shows. And then down here, it still shows in an Apple thing. So he was still like, he was like, it's two insidious companies <laughs> trying to sell everyone. And really, all this change down below is what they're selling like these are more mom and pop shops and then they become more 
corporations, which I thought, I mean, I still hate what's happening below, but I thought that was just an interesting observation he made that I didn't see while drawing it. Uh, this is West 67th Street and Broadway in 1936, and that's it today. Um, this is the Lennox Lounge, which I was unaware that they tore down because I left New York in 2016, so that was uh, quite a shock, but right before, this is below, right before it was torn down and up there is in the 40s. This is uh, Whitehall Street in the 1960s in the Financial District. And that's it today. This is the Majestic Theater in 1939, and it was abandoned for a long time. Um, and this is what it looks like today. They, uh, Harvey Lichtenstein, he would walk by this every day and when it was abandoned, and finally and he bought it, and then he had them renovated, and it's now the Bam Harvey Theater, uh, which, as you can see, is actually exactly the same except for the, the uh, marquee is gone. Oh, in the doors, but everything else is pretty similar. Then this is a little hard to see, but this is four uh, decades of CBGB, and it was actually a restaurant in the 40s. Then it was CBGB in the 70s and 80s, and it's a John Varvatos today. And this is the 125th Street Apollo Theater in, I can't see the dates, but you know, back, back then. <laughs> And there, oh, 1964, and this is it as it is now. Um, I'm not going to read this, but just to kind of give a quick overview of some of the stuff I did incorporating a bit of history in this book. So this is the World's Fair, the 1960s World's Fair. So we still have, obviously, some of these remnants are still out there. And I kind of go through the history of how that came to be. And I trace the history of the lampposts, which you see on the bottom right, which are now scattered all about the United States. And then there's some photos of how, what it looks like now. And I, when I first, the bottom one over there, when I first went to New York, it was when it was really abandoned, and then they recently repainted everything. So it looks really great inside the pavilion. And then this is a comic about uh, Bottle Beach, which is, you should just buy the book if you want to know about it. <laughs> and there's some pictures of what Bottle Beach is today. This is out across from Floyd Bennett Field. And then I put some other stuff in there that's some surviving buildings. So this is, you know, C.O. Bigelow, which I'm sure you guys all know about. And I, I kind of drew how it used to be and how it is today. This is actually the same building. I only do the storefront. So that's some of the surviving stuff inside of it. And some of our old bakeries. Some old signs around town. And some old music stores that are all now gone. And then I'll just end on this one. So yeah, this is a, a new building. Uh, obviously, they couldn't buy out the bottom one, so they kind of just built <laughs> over the top, which is I, it's like half horrifying, half fascinating to me. So I'm a little conflicted on that one. And I think that's it for me. Thank you. One, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, so happy to see you all here, and thank you to uh, Fran and Lillian and everybody at the uh, Museum of the City of New York. What a wonderful place, and I'm so glad to talk to all of uh, the panelists tonight. Um, Julia, your presentation put me puts me in mind of a question that I really have for all of you, which is um, I'm really interested in how the visual is the primary way that we sort of encounter the way places change and slip out from uh, underneath whole populations and people. Uh, that fish market that we saw the documentary about is maybe four blocks from where I grew up. And uh, I, used to, I used to go there and just like the site of that facade is a part of the Upper West Side that I know. And there are other places in the city that just like irritate me now because of the way that they look, you know? Um, this is like the sort of main site of my grievance around this stuff. And I wonder, maybe we can start with you, Julia, since your work is foremost visual, but um, all of your work around this kind of goes to that, the way that we can kind of see something that you can't necessarily 
um, change? I just wonder, you know, what you thought about that as you were yeah. re doing um, your research. Yeah, I mean, doing the the book and finding uh, the old photos and then going to the place to see what it looks like now is definitely an exercise in irritation because <laughs> often I would get there and it, you know it would be an Apple store or I would find little bits remnants of what was still there and what really got me I think was I I mean I really wanted to know the history of New York and I'd read a lot about it but I and I kind of didn't realize until I really started looking that it's there like the answers are there especially you know we inscribe a lot in stone here and sometimes an awning will get put over it or it's just there when you're walking down the street but you have to know what to look for because I definitely spent five years living in New York just you know head down going to the subway uh, earbuds in. I mean, I still put earbuds in. I don't need to hear everything. <laughs> but I just learned to look at the little bits of history that are around, because in order to know where a city is going, you have to know where it's been. And where it's been is still there for the most, I mean, obviously a lot of it is gone, but there's little hidden bits around. And in those little bits is kind of the answer to, you know, who we used to be and how we used to design stuff and what's happening to it now. So I just have learned how to see in a different way, which is part of being an artist, you learn how to see your surroundings in a different way. And I think that everyone should could benefit from that. Yeah. Sharifa in Harlem is nowhere. There's a, early on, there's a, you include a photograph of uh, a, some early, what turn out to be row houses, but they're kind of separated in this crazy vista in what is now Lenox Terrace. Like these, this, these blocks don't even exist anymore. I wonder, I mean, what that, how that worked for you. Yeah, I go back to that image constantly, even now that I don't live there and I'm not writing about Harlem, just because it's, it is um, such an amazing um, artifact of the in-betweenness of that space. It's an image from um, around, I guess, uh, 1870 or 80, and um, it, it shows the moment of speculation in Harlem, where someone would build three brownstones at a time, and then there was an empty plot, and then another two brownstones and then wilderness. And for me, it's just, a, it's a part of a story. It, it, it was an invitation to the a beginning, the beginnings and beginnings and beyond of what had been um, and really calling in a different way, calling us to look past the buildings to what was there um, as land, as homeland. And so I, it's just an important touchstone to like have that um, prehistory of Harlem as part of my work, yeah. Um, Jeremiah, I wonder, wonder what you think about this, because it, it, they're part of the visual to me. There's always this like, uh, this point at which I'm worried about being overly nostalgic or romantic in my, um, in my critique of what has happened. And you get to this a little <laughs> bit in the, the bit that you just read, that there's like, everyone has this personal New York um, but there's something else, right? There's a, a systemic thing that's happening as well. And um, I wonder how you thought about extricating one from the other or whether it's necessary to, to do that. To extricate the nostalgia, the, the nostalgia from this larger. From the yeah, systemic or yeah. Yeah, I think that nostalgia gets a really bad rap in our current culture, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, which I kind of resent. Um, I, you know, because. Look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a lot about neoliberalism, which is what I am sort of obsessed with these days, about like the current kind of economic philosophy and policies that we're living under, which are very anti-human. And nostalgia really is a kind of form of empathy. Uh, it, you can have empathy for people of the past. You can have empathy for people you don't know. You can have empathy for neighborhoods that you don't live in. You can, you can care about a lot, right? And... We're being told all the time to not care. Because if we don't care, then we're better consumers. And if we don't care, we're poorer thinkers and poorer feelers. Uh, so I'm all for nostalgia. I don't think there's anything wrong with nostalgia. And there's all this great research that shows that nostalgia is actually a meaning-making process that people who are nostalgic tend to be more empathic, tend to care more for other people, tend to live longer, happier lives, actually. So that's my bit about nostalgia. And then there's the larger part, which is 
Right, so the argument is this you're just nostalgic thing, which I think is a meme, which I think is a way of sort of undermining, again, the kind of caring for place and caring for people. You're just being nostalgic, which is just shut up and get over it. Um, and of course, it's much more than that. It is this larger process that's been happening to the city that's really not happened, at least since the Gilded Age. I love it if you could speak about it, actually, the process. You talk in your book about hyper-gentrification, the, 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 this process that is been accelerating since the early 2000s or somewhere thereabouts and really kind of exploded into being by the Bloomberg administration. Yeah. I wonder if you could speak about what the, how this is how that's different from yeah. what's happened in other places at other times, uh, populations swarming around each other and moving. It's hard to put that in a nutshell, right? But so, yeah. so it's um so in the 1970s in the midst of fiscal crisis, basically the the bankers came in and took over New York. They, they took over the governance of New York. Uh, and they said things like, New York has to look to Europe and say, give us your rich. That's a quote. Uh, so no more give us your tired, your hungry, your poor, right? It's give us your rich. And Bloomberg echoed that. Bloomberg said, wouldn't it be great if all the Russian billionaires would move to New York? Uh, so we're living in this oligarchy that was created uh, basically in a response to fiscal crisis the fiscal crisis was basically blamed on poor, mostly black and brown folks, right? So this was a way of getting this new kind of um, uh, philosophy of economics and philosophy of, of what people are about and turning everything into the market, this radical free market, so deregulation, privatization, and this is what was done to New York City because New York City was becoming a social democracy and the elites didn't want that to happen. So they took over, and they did this. And so over the years, that expanded and expanded. And Ronald Reagan, it be, you know, it's now it's it's the air that we breathe. And Bloomberg was really the ultimate expression of that. Bloomberg saw the city as uh, he called it a luxury product. He said it should be run like a business, um, like a private business, by the way. Uh, and so we're seeing what was public space, what was an open space, is a privatized city. I in honor, I guess, or with an eye toward the, um, the title of our program, I wonder um, what I really am tr trying to understand, even in my understanding of the city where I've lived all my life, is where the soul of a city resides. You know, a thing that always changing presents this, um, this moving target in some ways. And uh, there doesn't have to be one answer, but I wondered, um, Sharifa, your, your, your book deals a lot with the sort of literary heritage of you're dealing with, you were dealing with Harlem at the time. Um, the way writers have, um, through their characters and through their personal narratives, talked about their uh, moment of entry into the city um, and how in, in some ways there is this lineage um, that is literary as much as it is political and anything else. I wonder if you could talk about just um, the way that the soul of a place can be its art and its literature. Well, it's interesting because I think about like why I started writing about Harlem to begin with, and it was because of people that I talked to on the street, not because of books I had read, though the books were an important entry point. But it was al almost the sense that the people um, that I met on the street were um, the bearers of a tradition and a lineage <coughs> that I was a part of because I could talk to them about being from Texas and having family from Alabama, and, um, and that was my first point of connection. It really wasn't the literature, though that is important. And it, ca it came for me in the process of living and, and eventually deciding to write this book, which was provoked by these relationships. So like I always think about the relationships to, um, and the conversations and the, the fleeting um, connections as what started the book and then took me back into the literature, which then took me back into the street. and in the process of, of kind of making sense of all that, really deciding that I had to understand those things as being completely equal. And, and the weight of the undocumented library and the street was really the driver of that process for me. And maybe in, in thinking about this conversation and I think about the people that I talk to, some of whom I never saw again, some of whom have passed away, um, but that, connection and a sense of um, transmission 
is where I would locate like some question about soul. Um, and most of the artists that I found myself drawn to or just trying to excavate their entry were also in a process that was similar, like based on their experiences in Harlem and having entered to this place that had a meaning before they got there. So. Yeah, that reminds me, you know, I'm a very, I tend to be a pretty shy reporter, like it's my job to talk to people and I, I really have to work my way up to it. And I admired all the way in which all of you, there is a very strong, um, I don't know if it's a reporter's sense, but it is a, um, there is an encounter that happens in all of your work. Um, whether it's through um, the visual and then your, um, Julia, your, um, your deep, this deep research into these oddball characters, this the, um, abortionist of Fifth Avenue, uh, is that? Yeah, yeah, these amazing oddball characters of the past, um, of the present. I wonder, um, I'd love to hear all of you talk about just what, uh, to kind of follow off on what Sharifa just said about just the, the sense that you got from the people that you talked to in making your books and how, whether they gave you, uh, I guess the corny question is whether they gave you a sense of hope for where all this is headed, but also whether they gave you a sense of the texture of the city that you wouldn't have got gotten if you hadn't have written these books? Yeah, well, for me, um, my book is m a lot of illustration of buildings, but what's most important to me about a city is actually its people and uh, communities. I just hate drawing people, so <laughs> it's like it doesn't give it a, quite an accurate uh, description of what I think of New York, but yeah, people like Madame Rostel, who she was this abortionist who was loathed, and she was kind of nasty. She kind of deserved it, but... She, she would perform abortions for uh, these upper-class wealthy families at a time you know, when it was illegal, and so she held all of these secrets of the city, and she held it against them, sort of like, you know, I, I know that your daughter had an abortion, and I'm going to tell if you don't, you know. So they, she was really reviled, and the Catholic Church condemned her in the papers, and in order to spite them, she built this huge mansion, like, right down the street from the church. And it's just... I don't, that wouldn't happen in a small town. You know, she would have been driven out, but she provided a service that women needed, and then she was just kind of a kook, and I just, that's really fascinating to me that she could have so much power over New York's elite at a time when that, uh, sort of like we joke about like Upper East Side kind of, but they held so much power, and they still do, but she was kind of the most powerful person in that thing. So I just really got obsessed with these sort of characters that thrived in a sort of hostile environment, which keeps happening, and that can kind of only really happen in, in big cities. So, yeah, for me, for researching all of that, and then in, in through her, it tells the story of the, the climate of that time and the culture of that time and where the culture's values lied and what sort of on the seedy underbelly. So she just sort of represented to me a lot of different worlds wrapped up in one story. And when she killed herself, she did it in a bathtub wearing all of her jewelry, which is just such a classic, like, F you to <laughs> everybody who wouldn't let her be part of the upper class society. Um, so I don't really know if that answered the question. I just, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just like that it, yeah, that she represented a lot of different aspects of the city. Yeah. And Jeremiah, what was it like to, your process of research and reportage to get to where you got with Vanishing New York? I'm also pretty shy about going in and talking to people. Um, so uh, I'm kind of a voyeur in a lot of ways. Like I'll sort of, you know, a place that's closing, I might sit at a table for hours and just write about little snippets that I overhear or what I see or like I, I one of the scenes in the book is I'm in Cafe Edison and I'm watching the owner and it's the scene that, that sometimes when I read it, it brings me to tears. He would circle the the, the restaurant over and over and over again, and he kept running his hand over the counter, and it was maybe the second to last night of the business, you know. And he would he was petting it like a like it was this deer, like a I kept thinking of a horse, you know, sort of petting the the neck of a horse or something. This kind of goodbye that he kept doing. So I sort of observe people in that way, and then um, I'll sometimes I'll sort of linger around, um, hoping that someone will. <laughs> say hello to me, um, <laughs> and then I'll scurry out often. Um, that's usually how it goes. That's my childhood. Thank <laughs> you, guys. <laughs> um, while we're on this, in this van, though, Sharif, I'd love, just because one of my favorite parts of your book is you talk about the Schomburg and how um, 
it's it's a sort of like meta moment in the book because it's obviously part of the way the book was created, but it's also part of um, New York, uh, a part of Harlem that um, just means so much to the actual identity of the place. I wish, I'd love if you could just talk about um, not only your your research, but how that place came to take on a sort of totemic place in your book. Um, good question. <laughs> I'm, well, I, thank you. <laughs> um, I guess the reason the Schomburg became important as a place and not just as a research location um, is because of what happens there and, and the, the ongoing sense that people are there to find something. The sense you enter there with a sense of a quest constantly underway. And that was the, the founding kind of riddle of Arturo Schomburg growing up as a black Puerto Rican, being told as a child that, that African descendant people had no history and thus began the career of one of the greatest American bibliophiles. Mm -hmm. And and the sort of the, the sense that he was in this making this collection, like displaying evidence. Um, and that his just speaking of legacy, that his legacy continues in this very direct way. That people turn up at the Schomburg looking for things. They're not all professional researchers. Some of them are children, some of them are complete eccentrics. Um, but it's a, it just, in the time that I was there frequently and it became a part of just my daily turn, I, I felt like I needed to narrate that as well. Though I was told by people like, nobody wants to read about being in a library. But, <laughs> but um, it was important to me for that reason. Um, Jeremiah, you talk about in your book, you know, gentrification and, uh, neighborhood change and the the things that we see across the city it, it seems to be happening in like cascades in front of our eyes you know there are neighborhoods that are we've con come to all recognize this like process of like oh it's happening here and we can't really name the it but it's like presents itself in this like horror movie way of like ah it has moved to east new york or whatever and um uh you talk about uh also um Hudson Yards and how there, there's a, a process that's happening there that's obviously sort of openly exclusionary. Um, I wonder if observing those cycles as close as you had have in your book and on your blog, uh, you kind of are engaged in this every day, um, whether, speaking of sort of this hyper-capitalistic um, ideology is what it is, um, what can people what can people do? We saw some recommendations at the end of the documentary, but um, is capital as a force really to there is a way to, to really despair, I think. Um, but are there things that people can be doing that don't seem like drops in a bucket? Vote in people like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Right? Yeah. That was exciting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that gives me hope. Um, you know, ideology is the right word because it really, it really gets into people's heads, and it becomes so difficult to um, push back against the the thinking, and the, it's a real kind of brainwashing that happens, where the idea of this democratic socialism or this idea of like let's take care of each other let's let's take care of strangers oh my god you know is <laughs> so radical and crazy um, that people have to start reconnecting with that part of our humanity I mean I think it really starts inside of us um, so that ideas like bringing back commercial rent control which we had in New York City is not a crazy idea but is a is a completely reasonable uh, humane answer, you know, or the Small Business Job Survival Act, or more affordable housing that is not tied to uh, luxury development that is, you know, separate from that, or um, land co-ops. There are lots of things that people are starting to talk about that, that I think have potential, but I think it really starts in a shift in the psyche. Um, Julia, at the beginning of your book, you talk about you give this lovely sort of um, 
journey through your time in New York. And now you don't live in New York. And Sharifa, you mentioned you didn't necessarily plan to move to Brooklyn either, right? There's like these... I left New York and then I got asked to come back and I kind of had to move to Brooklyn. Right, right. There's this way in which like the city kind of like decides it doesn't have room for you or something. Like I always think about like the way people like reject organs. It's just like, oh. um, <laughs> boop, you're gone, you know? Um, but I wonder, Julia, if the... You obviously achieved a, a, a closeness in that same brief essay you talk about after that time of sort of beelining from place to place, you kind of open up and you are researching and taking photographs and really achieving a belonging in the city. I wonder, um, not to sound too like maudlin, but what happens, what, what, not being here, how does that all feel? To have, now that you, you've got a sort of, um, the book is a kind of like, you know, it's like a, it's a reminder of that time. I wonder how that feels now and whether that makes you feel, um, whether your departure, you, you frame it as a defeat almost at the hands of the city, um, uh, is your kind of also final statement of, well, you know, maybe it'll be too hard or something like that. Yeah, I mean, not living here and working on that book, I mean, I guess it feels like de depression. <laughs> like it was, <laughs> it was such a bummer working on that book and not being here. Uh, but at the same time, it, like I don't really see how else it could have, like it kind of went perfectly. Like, you know, I was like, I'm going to make this book about the city and the city's going to love me. And, you know, like I don't, I, I deserve like an apartment with rent control because I'm going to draw the bill, like so pompous. Um, and instead the city was like, yeah, like oh, we're done. We're done with you. Out you go. Um, and, and I did, it did break my heart because I kind of felt like I had just really fallen in love with it at just the time that I got kicked out of it. Uh, but I know it's really hard to describe like what that did feel like suddenly getting kicked out of, you know, so I lived in a basement studio in Greenpoint for 10 years and I paid $800, all utilities included. And it was great. And they like, never raised my rent until they were going to raise it so much that I just couldn't live there anymore. And I actually, I mean, I had a bit of a fear, this deviates a little bit, but when I agreed to do this panel and then I learned the topic, I was like, oh, am I being brought on this panel to be like the face of gentrification? <laughs> you, no, no, no. <laughs> I know, I'm like, I'm the, they brought me here is the problem. Um, but looking back during my time here, and I sort of made a very, I felt bad moving. I moved to New York, I was like 25, you know, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, white kid, moving into an Italian neighborhood and then a Polish neighborhood. And I was very aware that I was kind of following that path. And, you know, you can argue different people are responsible for different things, but I, I was like, okay, so if I'm part of the problem, I have to accept some of that responsibility and do what I can do. And you would just ask, like, kind of like, what can people do? And on my... From my point of view, all I could really do was shop locally, take trans public transportation. Because I think the worst thing you can do is move to a neighborhood, move into a glass tower, and then shop on Amazon. Like, that's what's destroying our neighborhoods. And, like, they make that, you know, quip it Fresh Direct. And sure, Fresh Direct's like a local company, and, you know, whatever. But it that's the problem. Like, there's a responsible way to to do to move into neighborhoods maybe where you feel bad about being there. But I tried to do the best I could. Um, sometimes you have to order stuff off of Amazon. Like, <laughs> if you really can't find it, but you, you should try pretty hard to keep things local and, like, be part of the community as much as possible. But then leaving that community, I definitely felt rejected by it. Like, I sort of felt, like I said, where I was like, but don't I deserve to be here because I love it so much? And that's just loving a place doesn't mean that people are going to keep you in it. Mm -hmm. So I did feel somewhat defeated where I couldn't. I was then facing... Uh, apartment shopping as a single female with an unstable income and everything I looked at right behind me were two people like a you know a white stable couple ready to buy up the apartments and I just couldn't and I realized I was not part of the neighborhood anymore and so I left and it broke my heart um, and now I'm here <laughs> I didn't mean to end it on that note but yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah there's this way in which we kind of uh, I think fetishize the difficulty of New York. That's part of the the idea is that it's somehow, and I think this is a, a, a newer idea. Uh, Sharifa, you write in, in, in your book about, there's a moment where you're going to, you left one apartment, which you moved into even though it didn't have a, kitch, have a kitchen because it had, it had a place for you to write. And then you are looking for other places um, and you go into this 
uh, this formerly grand place that it, there's, there's been a wall added and there's a fireplace which nobody could ever light because in any place in the room you'd be like burning up because of the fireplace. And you have this interesting flashback of um, during the Great Migration, people came and these were grand places that were obviously made for um, a bourgeoisie that was no longer there. And they, I can't believe people live like this. And then you are saying the same words but with the absolute opposite intention. Like, I can't be, believe people live like this, you know? Um, and I wonder what you think about just how that difficulty um, or that, that sort of almost forced difficulty, this kind of like Stockholm syndrome is how it feels sometimes, um, aids the way in which we almost sort of expect to at some point be bullied out of the places that we, we love. I wonder if there's any connection there. Um. I'm thinking right now, not about my own experience, but about a friend of mine who lives in the apartment that she grew up in, in Harlem. And her building has just been sold. And shes it's a building that over many years has been, um, you know, sort of a host for almost, I mean, it's been written about as a dorm for recent graduates of Brigham Young University. And um, so it's a building that's been like kind of under this wave of, of gentrification for maybe 15 years. And she finds herself in this position of like people who were gentrifiers like trying to make common cause with her. And she grew up in this neighborhood during the era of heroin and crack and everything else. And so when I think of difficulty, I think of that. I don't think of, um, I don't think of people just out of college slumming it or trying to find a cheap place or my 23-year-old idea that I need, did need a kitchen for my apartment. Um, but, but the fact that one reason, and this is something Michael says to me a lot, that this is a place where people struggled and suffered and survived and built to, in despite of, and that, the kind of honor given to that difficulty, I think is, the, the question of, of a continuity and that people have some right to live where they have been, where they manage to remain. And um, yeah, that's, I don't know about the fetishizing of, I'm not a New Yorker, you are. So like in terms of how that feels to someone that grew up here. And um, I'm, I just, I'm, my mind is going to people that I, who grew up here, like another colleague who talked about growing up in Harlem during the era of crack and was like, there should be monuments to that you know, that people survive that. And so I, there's lots to that question that I can't answer just based on my own experience of, of not being local and not having endured actual difficulty of the city. Um, but it was something that was important in terms of thinking about, you know, your, as you described, like what happened here, like what was done to the city in the 70s. And I, I mentioned a little bit like the buildings being burned and all those things um, that, the, the privations that people suffered were also deliberate. And, and I think it's important the way you frame, you know, that th this is a process that is not um, natural or benign, but quite deliberate. And, and I appreciate like the views of people that can think about how to interrupt that because in my own experience of having been drawn a bit into some of the city uh, processes around zoning and rezoning and, and these things, it, it was clear that there was a kind of theater going on about how this can be interrupted. So I'm always really looking toward people that have um, a more uh, hopeful sense about how it can be changed, because I don't have one. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting, what you, that rem it makes me think of the fact that so much depends on a person's mo moment of arrival or moment of sort of um, either a arrival or awakening to um, their environment. Um, Jeremiah, you write at the, uh, some, near the beginning of your book that one of the great tragedies of my life was that I had the misfortune to arrive in New York City at the beginning of its end. And that for you is the, um, the mid 90s, is this 1993? 93, yeah. yeah. Um, I wonder, I mean, you, you, you talked before about how um, 
that there's a, a literal way in which that's true in terms of the Giuliani administration and things like that. But I wonder how it feels to kind of be someone who arrives and then also be a kind of historian going back and back. How do you um, calibrate what, ob what must obviously would be sort of blind spots, things you don't know, um, but with a sort of sense of ownership because you've, you've, you know, you've really staked a place. Uh. What makes me think about the, I think there's been a, uh, I think there's been a changing perception of new arrivals to the city, right? That the new arrival used to kind of have this place, whether, you know, whether they were coming as immigrants or they were coming from the South or they were coming from middle America, wherever they were coming from, that there was, um, that, 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 that had a place like E.B. White talks about the settlers, right? That there were these three New Yorks, the settlers and the commuters and the natives, and that all three are, are part of, I guess, the soul of the city. And, and, you know, now when people talk about sort of like the newcomers, there's a new kind of newcomer here. I mean, it's, there are some of the old type of newcomers who still kind of make their way in, but there's also a new kind of newcomer, and I, and I see a lot of them in the East Village, and they don't want to be New Yorkers. They don't want to be a part of the neighborhood. They don't want to shop local. You know, my building was sold, and there are some new folks who've moved in, and they fill the hallways with cardboard boxes that are delivered all day long, you know, in the days when I'm there, my buzzer never stops ringing because the delivery guys are just dumping these boxes in the hallway. And uh, they do things like, now I'm gonna get into the complaining part of the night. We're they, all here for- They do not say hello, and I will say hi, and they will literally look at the ground, ignore me, until I disappear, until I go by. Uh, and I hear the story over and over and over from people in every neighborhood around the city. So, you know, they do want to move into these glass towers and they do want to just shop online and they, and they want to move into, there's this horrible new building, um, at Two Bridges, this uh, one Manhattan Square monstrosity where they have the banner around it and it says, your own private movie theater, your own private bowling alley, your own private garden, your own private driveway. Um, and they want to have a private existence, and New York City is, to me, not about that. It's about living in public. And um, so I guess uh, in my, my own estimation, I'd like to think of myself as the old kind of newcomer. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm open to critique. It's okay. <laughs> what was, okay, I'd, I'd love to know, before we go to questions, what was the... There is that old kind of newcomer, and I totally recognize what you mean. But what was did it come? Did that feel to you like a responsibility? Was it like I'm here? I need to know. I need to force myself out, or was it just, or was it just no. a, a an assumption that you made that everyone else made? It, and, was, and it was something I was starving for mm -hmm. to be in the city to be amongst other people, to be amongst difference, to be connected. To, I wanted to become a city person. Mm -hmm. I wanted to become a New Yorker. So I, it wasn't something I thought, oh, I have to work on this. It was like I was desperate for it. Yeah. And I think that's a difference. I think we're going to go to questions. I'd love to um, see if folks, I'm going to try to, yeah, OK, we've got microphones going around. Um, and I'll just try to see if I can. I see this hand in the middle here. Um, so maybe a microphone will meet her, and then we can make our way around. Hi, thank you for sharing your work. It's all lovely in its own way. Um, I had a question to the hopeful note uh, that was asked for earlier. Um, in different times in New York City's history where there is this fight with gentrification, you see great movements emerge, Jane Jacobs fighting the super blocks and uh, Jackie O uh, advocating for the landmarks preservation law. Um, what are the movements that you're seeing now that give you some hope uh, you know, in, in fighting this trend? Well, um, I 
see, I feel most hopeful looking at young people in places like out in Brooklyn and in the South Bronx who are fighting like the Brooklyn is not for sale, the not for sale movement, Brooklyn is, there's lots of not for sale. Um, those people are actually out in the streets and putting their bodies on the line and they give me the most hope. Uh, I saw here and then I'll zigzag backwards. So. Oh. <laughs> Next time I won't make you sprint, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Nina Shadab. Um, I wanted to ask about um, different examples of buildings, like Cat's Deli, for example. They are, I think, a rare case of them owning their own building, so they don't have to worry about uh, being driven out. And But that's just, I think, the exception to the rule. Like, we, most of the time when they're, it, the system is in a way where you can't, when the, the price is too high, you can't fight it, basically. And so um, when we're looking at affordable housing, and that's the solution, if by, if when we're seeing these different movements, are you hopeful that, um, like along with the theme of hope, um, that other cities are kind of um, adopting that type of resistance and that resilience and are trying to fight back against um, this gentrification this movement of um, driving uh, people out of their homes and are gaining some humanity to 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 keep New York City uh, as the place it is public. Um, yeah, I I wanted to echo what you said about like interactions with young people being like one site and there being so many interesting groups that are working on not only educating young people but like using the knowledge of people who have grown up in these neighborhoods in this moment. The people, the young who are, are you know, their life in New York has been formed by this moment of trans transformation I think are incredible resources for rethinking what the city is and could be. Um, I remember I lived actually like for a few months while I was finishing up this book, I lived in Paris and I was, you know, that sort of classic thing of like, oh, there's the florist, there's the hardware shop, there's the shop that sells baskets, um, there's the wine shop. And then going a few blocks and it being the same thing and just asking someone like, why is it like that? Like, why, why is it like that? Like every few squares, there's the same stores over and over again. And I think someone sort of gave me like some kind of really simple, like the government did something, but later in just my curiosity did find that the local government had a program to support the proliferation of small businesses on this scale from neighborhood to neighborhood to neighborhood. And this was the will of the local government. That's why it was the way it was. And I think that's, I mean, it's obviously a really different political situation and not one as we have here where the, real estate industry is incredibly intertwined with local government, um, which I'm sure some of you know more about than I do because I kind of try to ignore it. Um, but I think this is one example of how the election of, of people who have a different sense of care and community could lead to really um, concrete changes. It's one example at least. Um, but that's all I have to say on that. Maybe there, I'm sure there are people in the audience that have their own um, experiences and notions, which I'd be curious to hear. I saw yours, yeah. You, uh, yes, you. Okay. <laughs> um, what I, thank you. I've, I'm 74 and I've lived in New York all my life. And when you were talking about nostalgia, oh, by the way, I think you can live in New York for a very long time and not be a New Yorker and you can come to New York as I think you did and realize that you're a New Yorker. If, I hope I'm being clear. I don't Absolutely. know if I no, am. Yes. But what I wanted to say was that I left uh, my family's apartment when I was 18 and I moved to the East Village and I was going to Cooper Union and everything seemed to coalesce around that point. But when you were talking about nostalgia and how nostalgia is a form of empathy, one of the things 
that I realized was I was living in a building that was unrenovated and it had been built in the 1880s and the floors were on angles and the tub was in the kitchen and there were two non-working fireplaces and next to the tub was a sink and next to the sink was what looked like a phone booth but it was really the toilet. <laughs> and, but it was a lived in space and I think that to some degree the soul of the city resides in lived in spaces and lived in places and um, what's happening now is, and you were talking, I think you were, Jeremiah, about walking into the elevator or the laundry room. I think it was you who was saying I, this. I wish I had an elevator or a laundry oh, room. Well. But the hallways. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. No, but what, I, well, I wish I didn't. But what I wanted to say was, you know, young people are moving into your building, and they don't make eye contact, and they don't hold the doors. And you really feel as if you're invisible. Um, I talk to them, and some of them, you know, are sort of taken aback and don't know how to deal with it. But um, I'm sorry. I, I know I'm rambling. But no, no, no. That's um, thank you all. I, I'm, I'm rambling. I should shut up. <laughs> it's perfect. I really should shut up. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I was very moved by what you said, and also what you said about nostalgia. And when I left, about. 16 years after I moved in, I left that building and I was paying $65 a month in rent. And I looked it up recently on Street Easy. It was bought by a developer, it was gutted, and the apartment that I lived in uh, was converted into a duplex with the apartment on the, um, actually the floor beneath it and rents for about $6,500 a month. <coughs> and all of the soul is gone, it's cookie cutter. Yeah. Um, well, there, there's a, like an attack, I mean this, this hyper-capitalist culture too attacks anything that's old, right? And anything that's not, that's not that's old. And, and anything that has endured, there's something about endurance that they also don't like, right? So they want high turnover. So we're hearing a lot about how uh, the problem with the retail spaces now is, right, they're going to be all pop-up shops. And this is supposed to be a wonderful thing that is going to just be so exciting to have this constant, you know, chaotic turnover and there's no consistency and the rents are going to go up, 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 and up because every time you boot somebody out, you get to raise the rent. There's somebody right behind. Yes, you. Um, the mayor was uh, at a town hall last night on the Upper West Side, and um, he was asked about the uh, lo loss of um, local businesses, and most recently Leitner's, which has been on the Upper West Side for 54 years, I think, uh, has, has announced it has to close um, because the rents are going up. Um, and uh, so he, he, uh, the mayor made the claim that commercial um, rent control is arguably unconstitutional. Um, it would ha um, and so my first question is, um, what do you think about that claim? And, uh, and he basically said, well, there's a, um, something that he's supporting. I think it has to be passed at the state level um, for a vacancy tax uh, on landlords. Uh, and then he basically said, um, you know, we have to shop local. And he encouraged people to do that. And that was... That was basically his response. So, and my second question is, what do you think of uh, Mayor de Blasio's legacy, um, a record in this area? I, I truly hope that Mayor de Blasio's record is st still being written. That's what I hope about his... Uh, but yes, I'm an optimist. But, you know, I think that there are many ways in which I think that he uh, represents an improvement on his predecessor, but there are ways in which his campaign rhetoric still has not been matched, especially um, especially in, in the area of housing. It, his um, deputy mayor for housing um, is someone who previously was at Goldman Sachs, and I think that there is a way in which the idea that certain kinds of market rate housing are going to, um, if we just tweak it right, is going to be the, the the salvation of us all, and a certain squeamishness around also homeless people who are being very ill-treated in the city. Um, and uh, uh, when one council person says that we won't take them in this 
neighborhood, there's this sort of NIMBY soccer that happens of real people's lives that uh, uh, I think um, there's been a certain uh, dearth of courage, shall we say, but still being written. That's what I think about de Blasio. I don't know if, uh, if anybody else has got any thoughts. Just, oh, you know, one thing about, about shop local that I'd like to say is um, I definitely think we need to shop local and I support shopping local absolutely. The phrase shop local, I think that it can be used by people in power to shift the blame onto individuals, right? And it's a very clever way to do it because it, it makes us feel guilty and it makes us feel responsible. So it's really powerful. And what it does is it's saying, oh, oh, your, your local business closed? Well, you, that's your fault. You didn't spend enough money there. Um, and it's... You know, it's another one of these psychological tricks that they're trying to do to us. And we have to watch out for that. Okay, we got time for two more I see here, and then I see back here. I'm going to do this, this. Thank you. Um, it's interesting to me that uh, you've talked about the notion of uh, commercial rent control, but it was the one thing which seemed to me to speak so loudly from its absence in the presidential campaign that not a single candidate mentioned the problem of gentrification in terms of where people live. And that's the real problem that faces people in New York, not so much, I mean, businesses are fine and good, but in every neighborhood, Park Avenue, I have friends who have trust funds and they feel they're being pushed out by people who don't even live here. So, uh, in terms of talking about commercial rent control and the mayor saying it's unconstitutional, well, the rent control law was upheld by the Supreme Court several times. So why does no one talk about rent control as a solution for the national problem of gentrification in San Francisco and in Boston and here? I think the answer to that, at least here, is the uh, the power of real estate as a uh, as a as a force, a political force. But I don't know, I don't know how that manifests everywhere else. I think it's a great, you know, I think all, especially on the national level, don't you feel that like all of sort of the conversation about urban places is totally underdeveloped? Like every candidate says, yes, and then we'll have opportunity zones, and then they stop talking about it. Like what is that even anymore? Like I, the last person to explain that, I don't know. And, um, or someone says that all urban places are hellscapes that they will, only they can fix, right? Um, so I, I, it is, it's, there's no real serious national conversation about urban places, which is very, uh, in terms of housing or anything else, which is kind of depressing. I don't know if others. I'm just remembering being on a radio show and someone calling in from rural, Minnesota talking about gentrification as a farmer, you know, and, and large agricultural conglomerates pushing them out. So it's beyond rural, it's beyond urban even. It's, it, and it goes back to what you said about the, the kind of the larger system of, of neoliberalism. I'm sorry, it's our last one, but there, you guys just already said this one, so I'm gonna go there. Hi, um, I feel there is, um, you know, among all these tremendous pressures, you know, especially with Rebney, the Real Estate Board of New York, which, by the way, is very tied to the mayor of New York, uh, there is some hope because I belong to two uh, preservation groups, and we've been pushing very hard our public officials for uh, zoning and zoning protections. In fact, we were able to create a... Uh, a uh, historic district in the East Village, which was almost impossible. And we were able to save about 400 tenements. But uh, there is legislation they're trying to push through Albany, which is, will be increasing the FAR throughout New York, which is increasing the zoning. Fortunately, with the pressure of all these groups, that did not make it through the legislation, but it may come up in the next uh, in the next session by increasing the zoning in our various neighborhoods. 
that have already been contextually zoned. So I feel, but I feel there is some hope because we are working very hard by going to uh, hearings at the LPC and all these various hearings before the uh, city council and also uh, voting for people who are supporting our communities. Uh, in other words, our council members and being aware of what is going on in our communities politically. And I think we're gonna we're gonna go out on that note. Upstairs there will be a reception, and I think Fran can tell us the rest of the programming for tonight. First, I just want to thank this wonderful panel. Um, thank you, Sharifa. Thank you, Jeremiah, Julia, and Vincent for a fascinating <laughs> conversation. And <laughs> I invite you all to join us upstairs, one flight up in the rotunda. There's both stairs and an elevator. And um, the authors will be uh, signing their books, which are for sale in the gift shop. And we have a cash bar open. Um, and so please join me in a final round of applause. Um, hopefully.